in church? You fired up to be in the house of the Lord? You fired up to hear the word of God? Amen. Well, me too. Um, it is awesome to be able to worship with the family this morning. Uh, you guys sound awesome, so that lets me know that you guys have been spiritual throughout the week. That you guys have been in your word throughout the week, so that fires me up as a minister, amen? You know, but I, I'm extra fired up today because there is a special visitor among us. I don't know where she at. She disappeared. But our sister Bonita is in the house. You know, but, but what I love about Bonita is that she loves to preach back at me. Man, when Bonita was here before she moved to Chicago, she had her little corner right here. Anytime something hit her and moved her, she gave an amen. She gave a hallelujah. She let you know the word was working in her heart. So I know she's going to come back in the room, but I'm fired up to hear Bonita preach back to me this morning. Before we get into the Holy Scriptures, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Father, we humbly come before you in honor to be able to be vessels used by you. God, we are so grateful that you have sent your son to die on the cross for our very souls. God, thank you for giving us an opportunity to lift up our voices to you, to sing to you, to glorify you with our life. God, thank you for calling us to lay ourselves on the altar, Father. God, we are so grateful that you protect us from Satan's schemes. Father, we are grateful that you are the protector of our lives and of our souls. God, thank you for being us with us this morning. Open up our hearts, prepare our hearts this morning to receive your message with great eagerness, but that we can actually not just receive it with eagerness, but that we can do something with it. God, thank you for allowing me to be here to preach before your people. What an honor and what a privilege. We love you so, so much, and we pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. Open up your Holy Scriptures with me to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, you know, it's awesome in this particular chapter because Jesus, in the beginning, was in the desert for 40 days. And as he was in the desert for 40 days, he fasted for 40 days. He had no water, and he had no food. And he was tempted by the devil. But the particular passage that we're going to look at right now, in verse 14, it talks about how Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. You see, when you fast and pray, you get some power right there from the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at it and see what kind of power did Jesus receive and how the Holy Spirit moved him to preach the word. Let's look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. Amen. To release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Jesus starts off and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. I got to ask you this morning, is the spirit of the Lord upon you? Because when we see when the spirit of the Lord is on you, you know you were anointed. And Jesus, because he knew the spirit was on him, he knew he was anointed. And because of that, he preached the good news to the poor. There's Bonita right there. I told you she was coming. I told you she was coming. 
But Jesus, he says, he sent me to proclaim fee- freedom for the prisoners. Yeah. What I love about Jesus is that he came with a mission. Yeah. He came understanding that, hey, I'm going to be a revolutionary. Yeah. That I'm going to go out and I'm going to preach freedom whether somebody follows me or they don't. But he also says, this is what the scripture says about me, that I have come to fulfill the scripture. And I have to ask us this morning, have we fulfilled the scriptures about us? When the Bible says, when you become a disciple, you go out and you preach the word. The title of my lesson today is simply the work of a revolutionary. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, give me an amen when you get there. This is going to be our context for this morning. I hope you like contextual lessons because there's, there's just so much meat and potatoes in there that God gives us in his word. Let's go ahead and read verse 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, Jesus did exactly what he said he would do in Luke chapter 4. He said he would go out and proclaim the kingdom. He said he would go out and heal the blind. He said that he would preach freedom to the prisoners. And look at what Jesus is doing. It says Jesus went through all the towns and the villages. You know, Jesus in this passage, he teaches what kingdom work is. He teaches what the heart of the kingdom work is. And he, and he goes and he, he says he asked for workers for God's kingdom. You know, point number one today is do as Jesus did. Amen. Point number one, do as Jesus did. And in verse 35, I, I want to read it again to you so that it sinks in a little bit. Yeah. But it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus went through all these towns. And it's awesome because even when you look at chapter 9 and you read through that whole entire chapter, Jesus, he healed a dead girl. He healed a sick woman. He heals a blind. He heals a mute. He did all of this before he then stops and goes to another town and starts preaching again and healing again. See, Jesus was a worker. He was a revolutionary worker. And I hope this morning that you gain a conviction and answer your calling that Jesus called you to do. You know, we see through verse 35 that he ministered to the physical and the spiritual needs of the people. Jesus loved healing people. And when I look at this, I got I to gotta like ask myself this question. Do I love healing people yeah. with the word of God? I got to take, take a step back and, and get sober for a second and say, do I love preaching to the people of God? Do I love preaching to a lost world? Because my Lord and Savior loved to preach the word and to heal souls. You see, there's some of us in, in these pews this morning that need some healing. Yeah. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and ask, do you need some healing this morning? Need some healing this morning. Don't lie now. <laughs> Don't be prideful. Don't try to act all self-righteous like, I am good with the Lord. I've had my quiet time this week. You know you struggle with something this week. Amen. Go ahead and get some healing this morning. But you know, Jesus was in the ministry. And ministry means service. So you don't have to be full-time in the ministry like me to be in God's service. You know what's funny? Don't get mad now. 
But Jesus calls you to the same standard he calls me to, though I'm paid full time. Don't get mad at me, amen? So don't get mad when I call you to do, don't get mad if I ask you to come preach up on Sunday. Don't say, bro, I'm not paid. It's okay. You in the service of the Lord. Because every disciple is a servant of Jesus Christ, amen? Let me, let me just reference a scripture for you this morning just to help your heart. Because I just want to let you know how awesome Jesus is, our king, the king of kings. In Mark 10, 45, it is for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. See, that's the God I serve. And if that's the God I serve, and the king of kings, the alpha and the omega said, I'm going to come to earth and serve. Well, by all God means, I'm going to serve with all my heart. And I want to call this as, metro, as the Metro Heights region to have the heart and the mindset to serve God's people. You know, it says that Jesus multitasked. He taught, he preached, and he healed. Some of us can't even chew bubble gum and walk. Some of us, you know, we said we wake up in the morning and say, hey, okay, I have my quiet time, I have my prayer, but now I got to deal with people's sin? Now I got to deal with the people in the world that act crazy to me at work? I, man, I don't know if I can multitask here, Jesus. I don't know if I can walk and chew at the same time. But you know what? As a disciple of Jesus, he calls us to multitask. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. You fired up this morning? Yeah. In Acts chapter 2, a very familiar passage. In verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. You know, one of the biggest reasons I believe that the church exploded during this time was because needs were met. When they understood what Jesus did for them, it moved them to become disciples, but then it moved them to be like Jesus and to serve with all their heart. You know, it said that they sold all their possessions and they gave to anyone as he had need. What I learned from this is that it wasn't accountability, it wasn't expectations, that turned these people into workers, but it was, it was the joy that they had in their walk with God. Yeah. It was the gratitude that they have received in their salvation, but most importantly, their needs were being met. Yeah. And when the people's needs were being met, guess what happened? They were fired up, they were glad with sincere hearts. Yeah. You see, you might be wondering why you're struggling. It's probably because your needs aren't getting met. And, and, and as, as a congregation and as a family, we need to meet those needs. But we also can't be critical when your needs aren't getting met, amen? Because if everybody is doing their job in the church, everyone's going to be fired up. There will be no needy person spiritually. There will be no needy person physically because we are able to take care of them. You know, these guys were fired up to serve with all their hearts. And what I love is that many of us may be in serving roles, but some of us may not be fired up to be serving. I don't see that right here from the first century church. They, they, they didn't just serve because they were asked to serve. They served because they were fired up and willing to serve. And sometimes we can wonder, man, why is my Bible talk not growing? Why is my ministry unfruitful? Well, it's probably because you have a lot of needs in your group that have yet to be met. 
But let me tell you something else. Don't get mad at me now. It's not just on your leader, but it's on you. Because as a, as a leader, we're called to meet needs, but we're one person. We're not Jesus. Now, we're trying to be like Jesus, but we're one person. But some of us got five, ten, even 15 people in the Bible talk. And you expect your, your leader to do all the work and meet all the needs. And you have yet to lift up a finger to do anything in your group. I want to call us to have the right attitude when you serve. Amen. Because this is what the first century church did. But you know, what is the importance of getting your needs met? Well, one, it helps you to overcome, right? Any struggles, any temptations. You feel loved and you feel taken care of. And so when all those needs are met, however way you need them, you are not focused on yourself anymore. And so because the needs of the church were being met right here, Nobody was focused on themselves. They were just focused on preaching the word and advancing God's kingdom. And that's why it says in 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who are being saved. Amen. See, when your needs are met, people's souls are getting saved. Wow. You know, I want to I share an example of where I felt like my need was met at a crucial time for me. I remember being in Portland, Oregon, and I was, I was struggling financially. And I hadn't uh, come back from Oregon to California in, in a couple years uh, to even visit my family. And I remember I was, I was talking with this brother, and uh, we, we, no, I, I wasn't like, we, he just kind of asked me, what are, you, what are your plans for Christmas, and da, da, da. And I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to stay in Portland like I normally do. He's like, you're not going to go see your family? No, I, I can't. I can't afford to, to, to get all the way out there to California to go see my family and visit my mom. It's been a couple years, but, you know, amen. Like, my mom understands. She's a disciple. She knows I'm out here working for the Lord. Um, but this brother, his name is Jose Montes, and uh, it's one of, one of my best friends. And, and I'll never forget, he said, bro, I will buy your ticket. Wow. I will buy your ticket. And he even gave me extra money to come out here to see my mom. And that meant so much to me, and, and, and it filled a need in my heart and a longing that, I, that I, I had to go visit my family. And sometimes you just don't know what people are going through unless you talk, unless you ask questions, and unless you ask, hey, what can I do to help you? And I believe that if everyone in this church had that mentality, everyone's needs would be met. But you know, the challenge for us in our day and time is that the world it teaches you to worry about money. It teaches you to focus on your own status and your own accomplishments. And the world does not call us to focus on each other in building each other up. That is one of the lies of Satan that, that can creep into our hearts and creep into the church. That we have our own problems. I'm not even trying to mess with your problems because I got enough of mine on my plate. We all got problems. But even in the midst of your problems, you got to go after helping God's kingdom with their problems. We need to be able to say that I have helped my brother in any way that I can to help them be who they need to be for God or my sister. But you know what I love about Metro Heights is that we have so many servants in this building. You know, I think of Richard Cato. I think of Richard Cato, who just serves tirelessly, even at men's midweek. You know, everyone, like, we have our late meetings uh, with some brothers. He's always there to shut down the building, lock up the gates. And he's newly married. He has a wife. Like, he, you know, Vicky probably struggling because he come home at, like, 1030, like, where my boo? But, Vicky, if you ain't in the room, your boo is serving. Amen. You know, Richard says, I, you know, I, I think about Moses. Moses. Where Moses at? Man, Moses, like, will give you his house and move out if you needed a, a place to stay. And he's done that. He has done that for some of the sisters. 
And, and, and Moses, like this guy is, is just so giving. And some of the things that have happened to him in the midst of serving God's kingdom, I would have been like, ooh, my heart would have been. <laughs> I said, this brother right here has a heart of gold. I think about Ricky Ball. Ricky Ball and Talisha and, and, the, and, the, and the, what do you call this thing? The, uh, the AV crew. You know, they're always here early and setting it up so that way my, my, my voice can be heard through the mic and I don't have to scream because I got a baby voice, amen? You know, they take care of me with the sound up here. But they're out here serving, they videotape, like they do all these great things. I think of Takoya. Where's Takoya at? Takoya just be using her little hoopty, driving people around, picking people up. Even though her car might break down, she said, I'm still going to serve the Lord and drive God's people around. So praise God for all the people that serve with driving, amen? Think about Casey Christensen, who if you ask, if you drop the ball as a leader, you say, sis, I need you to get this. She's on it. She protects us, amen? Because sometimes we just drop balls like, sis, we forgot this. We need to go get this. She's on it. She just sir, doesn't ask questions, doesn't get bitter in the midst of our, un, you know, lack of discipline. You know, I think of Amanda Lee who stays up late trying to get all the stats in. She'd be, she'd be discipling me and Michael. She'd be like, you know, hey, bro, you know, I need your stats in. Mostly Michael, amen. <laughs> it was one time, it was one time. You know, get your stats in, bro, because... You know, I'm, I'm, I have to finish the post for Metro Heights, and I'm staying up till like 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. We're like, ooh, we over here making this sister stay up. Like, amen, sis, we'll repent. But she gives her heart in the admin. I think of Willie. Where's Willie at? You know, Willie, a, a month ago, asked me, bro, how can I serve? How can I serve? What can I do? I said, bro, I don't know. Let me pray about it, and we're going to find you a task to do in the church. And Willie is our stage master, Amen. I think about the Haineses who just serve tirelessly. I mean, you heard James, like this, this guy's barbecuing. And he has to get up super early just to go to work and he stays up. He probably got like three hours of sleep just to raise special missions to help his group meet their goal. But you know, in the midst of, of serving, in the midst of doing all these things, sometimes it drains you a little bit. And, then, and I, have to, I have to let you know this morning, I want to give you a practical on what you can do when you feel burnt out. Because there's no such thing as being burnt out if you're close to the Lord. Amen. Yeah. I hear too often, I need a break. You only need a break because you're relying on your own strength. If that's the case, I'll be, I should be taking vacations every week. Because of the stuff that I'm trying to juggle with God's people. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Let me, give you, let me give, go ahead and give you a practical. Let me go ahead and give you a, a, a nice insight Come on, bro. that you probably have missed. How was Jesus able to meet the needs by going to all these towns and villages and then dealing with his disciples? In 34. I'm sorry, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when he found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogue and driving out demons. Now, mind you, before this, in verse 29, through 34, it says Jesus heals many. And you can write that down and go back and really see what Jesus did. So the day before he heals all these people, he probably had a late night, probably didn't go to sleep till like 2 o'clock in the morning. Because even at the end of the verses, it said in 33, the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So that means if Jesus was in a building, he probably was trying to go to sleep. Yeah. And then people are like... And just, just asking to be healed. And he goes to sleep late, but he says very early in the morning, he went off to a solitary place to get refreshed, to get rejuvenated, to get faith, to get hope. So that he can go out and continue on healing people. 
You know, the demands of life push Jesus closer to his prayer life and not from it. You see, the, delight, the demands of life and the ministry should never distance you from your prayer life, but ultimately draw you closer in your prayer life to God. But, you know, sometimes there's going to be needs in the ministry that you cannot meet. You know, sometimes we try to do a lot and we try to, try to juggle all these things and we just can't do it. Well, it's awesome because in John chapter 6, Jesus, when he feeds the 5,000, he asked his disciples, hey, how are we going to feed these people? And he did it intentionally to see what their answer would be. And the only thing Jesus was expecting them to say after seeing him heal and, and provide for all these needs, Jesus, we can't do it, but we know you can. Please provide. And that's what he did even though the disciples missed the teaching right there. And in the same way, sometimes we got to go to God in prayer and say, God, I, I don't know how to meet this person's needs. God, I don't even know what meat I can meet. God, please put it on my heart to meet a need or show me this week how can I meet a need and help your people in your church. I want to simply give us a challenge this morning. Pray to be a giver and ask someone what do they need. Pray to be a giver and ask someone, what do they need? Turn me back to Matthew chapter 9. Amen. Point number two, Amen. see the great need of compassion. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Amen. Give me a name when you get there. Amen. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's stop right there. You know, Jesus says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Jesus saw the great need for the lost. But he also wasn't annoyed by the crowds. It says that he had compassion. And sometimes we can get annoyed with all the needs in the church. We can get annoyed with all the crowds that we have to, to, to try to help. But right here, we understand Jesus was driven by compassion. Now, in the Greek, the word compassion is the strongest word for pity. Now, it describes that the compassion which moves a person is the, the deepest depths of his or her being. So when Jesus saw the crowd, he saw how helpless they were. He saw that man in his soul, in his every being, he wanted to do something about it. And it was this compassion that radicalized Jesus to keep preaching and healing these people. Amen, bro. But you know what's interesting? This scene, the disciples and Jesus saw the same thing. But the disciples didn't see what Jesus saw. Jesus saw the crowd for who they were and what they were going through. The disciples just saw them as a regular crowd just following Jesus to get healed. You know, when I think of compassion, I think of this, this sad story that I found uh, this week. Uh, and it's a story that happened years ago, but I, I want to read it to you. It says, a young father, James Lee, shot himself in a tavern phone booth. Minutes before, he had called a reporter and told him that he had sent the paper and envelope outlining his story. The frantic reporter tried to trace the call, but it was too late. When the police arrived, the young man was slumped over with a bullet through his head. In his pocket was a child's crayon drawing, much folded and worn. On it was written, please leave in my pocket. I have to have it buried with me. The drawing was signed in a childish print by the man's daughter. Shirley, who had died in a fire five months before. The father had been so grief-stricken that he had asked total strangers to attend his daughter's funeral so she would have a nice service. He said there was no family to attend since Shirley's mother had died when the child was two. And so when he called the reporter just before he took his life, Lee said that all he had in life was gone and he felt so alone. You know, many of us are thinking, man, if I would have known this guy, I would have loved him. Yeah. I would have tried to meet a need yeah. and try to help him to not feel alone, that there was no hope after his daughter had passed and his wife. 
But I believe some of us, we, we, we think that people are not hurting. Yeah. Some of us expect there to be a flashing neon light saying, I need help. Yeah. Some of us think that there's this flashing light above people that say, I am desperate for God. That I need God. That I'm alone. That I'm, I'm depressed and I want to kill myself. And because we don't ask questions, we don't open our mouth to share our faith because there's no compassion in our heart. Because people walk around as if nothing is going on. We say, oh, that person doesn't need Jesus. That person looks like they're fine. But little do you know there's people like this every day that you pass that are screaming inside, I need help. You know, it takes the eyes of Jesus to see a dying and hurting lost world. Yeah. I want to challenge us to get some compassion. Yeah. I want to challenge us to, to, to really have the eyes of what Jesus had. But most importantly, guys, I want to put this challenge before you because I'm going to do this challenge. I want you to fast and pray to have the eyes of Jesus Amen. and to see the world and people for what it is and where they're at. Because I know... To be open, compassion has not been something that I've been really focused on. You know, I've been sharing my faith, and, and a lot of the people that I've been sharing with have been so hard-hearted. Yeah. And, and, and I, I tend to take it personal. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know when you show, you're really giving your heart and you're trying to yeah. win a soul, but they're just so obstinate? I take it personal. And I saw that, man, I'm lacking so much compassion because little do I know they're hurting inside. Though Sometimes they don't even know. And I want to call us to stop being so focused on yourself yeah. and be focused on the hurt and lost world yeah. in this generation. Yeah. Let's look at verse 37. Point number three, the need of workers. Point number three, the need of workers. Verse 37, it says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What I found when Jesus said, Ask the Lord of the harvest, he says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And I found that in the Greek, to, to send out workers means a much forcible meaning. That it is that he would push them forward and thrust them out to go work. So it was kind of like Jesus set the example. He healed. He did all these crazy things. And then he's like, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. And then in chapter 10, he sends out the workers right there to go reap the harvest field. So this was one of the quickest answered prayers. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest and he will send them out. And then boom, Jesus sends them. Says, there you go. God answered the prayer. You are now the worker. Go reap the harvest. And sometimes we're like praying, God, give us workers. We need workers in the church. And God's like, I know. I sent you. Now just go make some more workers. But he says to send them out, to thrust them out to be workers. I want to call you to be thrust out this morning to go work for the Lord. Amen. But it's interesting, too, because I want to give you some perspective of what Jesus meant right here. So the, the type of thrusting would be like the same word used to expel a devil in a possessed person. So imagine, Jesus, I mean, you read how Jesus cast out demons. He said, bow. Woof. Them demons went, ran out screaming when Jesus said, get out. And Jesus is expecting the same thing when he says, hey, I'm sending you out. It's a thrust. It's like, I'm, I'm just throwing you and launching you into the battlefield. But you know, the one thing that we can deny and the truth that we can deny is that the harvest is plentiful. Yeah. Right. My Bible says right here, the harvest is plentiful, not, not just in Metro Heights, not just in the West region, right. not just Orange County, not just Ventura, not just Africa, not just Sao Paulo, everywhere. So even though people shut you down when you share your faith, the harvest is still plentiful. Yeah. And I, I was reminded of this uh, this week at USC with Carlos. You know, we were sharing our faith and we were like, we we're praying and like, God, like, please just open up people's hearts. You want to meet some like nice people, not some mean people. 
And because, uh, you know, I had to pray to guard my heart, you know, because sometimes I'd be like, mm, mm, mm. you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, try to keep, keep your spiritual right there. And, um, and, and we got so many no's. <laughs> but there was one guy that we ran into. And no matter how many no's you get, it doesn't matter when you find that one broken person. And there was a guy that when we first started the USC ministry, we met about like a year and a half ago. Carlos saw him and he was like, oh, I remember that guy. So we, Carlos ran up to him and I followed behind him. And uh, he, we started talking with him. And, he, and this guy has changed so much. Before he wasn't that open. He was really closed off. But now he's, his heart, God has humbled him. He's, he's done the college thing. And he's like, it's empty. And he was just being open and vulnerable where he's been at in his life. And he just got open about the thoughts of suicide and the things that he struggled with. And, and, and I, I was just like, wow. We started sharing our testimonies and just our heart with him. And all those no's I didn't care about. And I had to, I had to give God praise. I had to thank God. Because all that mattered was that one open soul. That is going to start studying the Bible. Amen. But, you know, the second thing that I see in this is that it says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. That shows us that there's a, there's a partnership with God. That God entrusts you to go out to be a worker and to share what you've been given. Yeah. See, God didn't need to use you because you're jacked up. Yeah. I'm jacked up. But God still found it in his mercy to use me. To use you. And, I, and, I'm, and it blows my mind that God would do such a thing. Let, let, let's, let's, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want to show you God's heart on the importance of being a co-worker in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, give me an amen when you get there. In verse 1. As God's fellow workers, we urge you to not receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in that day of salvation, I helped you. You know, Paul right here says, God, as God's fellow workers, we urge you to receive God, to not receive God's grace in vain. And I look and I'm like, man, God doesn't need us yet. He chooses us to be his workers. But our God tries to reconcile with us and, 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 and other gods don't in other religions. So not only does God try to reconcile with us, but as he reconciles with us, he then charges us and gives us the responsibility to fulfill a task for him. Because he has helped you in the day of your salvation. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I have yet to meet a famous person that came up to me and said, Aaron, I don't know you, but I want you to be my coworker. I'm going to be like, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> but most importantly, rich people won't even ask you that. But the, the, the God of the universe, who has created everything in it, who has given you everything in it, who has helped you, who has saved you, said, hey, I want to use you as a worker to do my will. <laughs> and what an honor it is to be a worker of God. Yeah. And I want to impress this upon your heart this morning to remember and to understand that it is a privilege to be asked to go out into God's harvest field and work. You know, in closing, Jesus wants us to see what he saw and he wants us to feel what he felt and he wants us to do what he did. And I believe as a church, as the, as the Re Metro Heights region, I believe that if we take these points this morning from Matthew 9 and we implement them in our hearts and make them deep convictions, we will work like a revolutionary, amen, to God be the glory, and I love you.